just um, take our seats. Uh, welcome to day two of State of the Net. Um, today we're going to focus on uh, bandwidth constraints, uh, new media services, entertainment in the cloud, and the like. And we have two morning keynotes this morning. We have, um, I'll introduce them in kind. Um, we're very fortunate that uh, Jared Polis, Congressman Jared Polis is with us today. He represents the second congressional district of Colorado. Um, the congressman, in a former life, has, has co-founded and founded several companies, uh, including Blue Mountain Arts um, and, and ProFlowers.com. Um, he, Ernst and Young, has um, called him Entrepreneur of the Year um, on, on occasion. And um, he, he serves on the Powerful Rules Committee in, in the Congress. And um, I don't know if it's uh, a fortuitous timing, but uh, in December he was appointed to the Judiciary Committee um, just in time for um, the SOPA debate. So, uh, Congressman Jared Polis, welcome. I heard that you uh, you haven't heard anything about SOPA or piracy yet in this in this uh, in this conference. Um, what I thought I'd do, since uh, I have a little time here, I, I certainly want to uh, take any questions you have. But I thought I would briefly go over uh, my thoughts on some of the items on your agenda. Um, I'm happy to focus, um, you know, in particular on on piracy if that happens to be the. Uh, the topic is your, but I want to cover some of the other things as well that um, are being talked about uh, today. Um, I certainly know that one of the things you talked about is uh, online sales tax should Congress weigh in. I think that's coming up actually later today. Um, certainly a hot topic. I think uh, inevitably there needs to be uh, some, uh, when you're looking at gathering taxes, uh, you want to do it in a way that distorts the economy minimally. Um, I'm not a fan of sales taxes generally. Um, so, I, for instance, there's a, a proposal called the fair tax that actually abolished the income tax and moved to a strictly sales tax system. I actually tend to think we should go the other way. Um, I think that as states look into it, uh, it becomes harder and harder to figure out who should and shouldn't pay a sales tax. I think that um, income and property taxes uh, are better ways uh, to, uh, to gather revenue with minimal distortions to the economy than a sales tax because it always becomes a question of who you apply the sales tax to. And uh, in an increasingly complex world, you have multiple jurisdictions that want to charge a sales tax. It becomes very difficult. Another topic, I think this one's from yesterday, geolocation, the Jones case, and the reasonable expectation of, of privacy. Uh, obviously, with new technology, um, it creates uh, new uh, uh, opportunities for custom customized experiences. And of course, the flip side is uh, uh, privacy. Now, I think that. Uh, many, you know, what we have is kind of a general generational shift in, in, in usage of technology. And I think many um, people who are comfortable with technology, who are kind of digital natives, have different expectations about what, what privacy means um, than uh, people who are just adapting to uh, the new technologies. Now, I think what's clear is the consumer has to be in charge, but most consumers who apply, and particularly consumers who are digital natives, are very happy to uh, give up much of their privacy in exchange for a customized experience that takes up less of their time. Um, you know, for instance, to see advertisements that are of some remote interest to them or targeted to them rather than something that's not relevant at all, to see a special or a coupon or savings from a store that's located near where they are uh, versus uh, across the country or across town. So um, again, the key thing is that uh, people want to be in charge of their own uh, information, but uh, many people um, in particular are more than happy to make that uh, transaction and in effect uh, sell some of their information, uh, particularly aggregate information, uh, to those who would provide them a superior user experience based on that. Um, another one uh, that we talked that I guess has been talked about is uh, communications content regulation and Reno versus the ACLU case and some of its uh, implications. Um, again, I think we are moving towards a freer and freer uh, communications uh, infrastructure. Um, there's really uh, limited ability uh, to, to regulate. Obviously, there's an issue of um, you know what's available, uh, where, and, and and what can be protected from schools, uh, you know, from kids and so forth. Uh, and again, I think this is uh, handled well by the private sector uh, and really needs to be handled in each household. Uh, it's a very hard thing to to. Uh, to regulate, um, but obviously, uh, as a you know new parent, I'll be you know he's only four months old now. He doesn't use the internet, but as he grows up, certainly it'll be my responsibility to ensure that uh, that's supervised and we have uh, the right uh, filtering software if appropriate. But uh, but even better, just to provide that personal 
uh, oversight into uh, what he is and isn't doing on the, uh, on the internet. Uh, patents uh, have also been discussed, and, and I think Congress kind of, we, we, missed, a, we missed a major opportunity at, at, uh, at, at helping to create a, a patent system for the 21st century. Uh, just a few months ago, we, we passed a few very minor uh, changes that don't really affect this particular uh, balance one way or the other. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the way Congress works, I think most in Congress think we've kind of, they kind of list patent reform in, in the done category, and it'll be hard to talk about it for another decade here. So, uh, you know, what we saw, you know, moving to first to invent, um, perhaps some changes at the Patent and Trademark Office, having an ability to kind of challenge post-issue and have it adjudicated, you know, with, with a patent um, administra administratively. These are very minor things. Um, I think fundamentally the issue is, is that we still have a patent system that is uh, pre sort of built on the mechanical era rather than the digital and biological era. And uh, it's time to, uh, to really uh, rethink what intellectual pro property protection does mean and should mean uh, in this new age. Um, I think what we currently do can probably continue to look, uh, exist alongside it for mechanical innovations, which certainly still exist and it seems to work fine for, uh, for fundamentally uh, mechanical or physical innovations. But we do need to think of what our intellectual property protection framework should be uh, for the digital and biological area. And that's never been a discussion that Congress has had. Maybe that's a good thing. Um, some kind of Congress has discussions, it's always not the best. But instead, it's basically been left to the administrative branch and the judicial branch. Uh, judicial branch through you know, a hodgepodge of different precedents has, has tried to make the 1913 framework work. Uh, and of course, administratively, the patent office has done whatever they can to try to apply and use their hopelessly uh, outmoded statutes and, and overworked and uh, understaffed uh, offices to provide as, as good services uh, as, as they can with regard to that. Um, finally, getting to um, piracy and and, uh, and and SOPA and so forth, um, you know, today of course being a fascinating day, many many websites have blacked out in protest of SOPA. Uh, what we hope is happening, what I hope is happening, is this is actually generating calls to members of Congress's offices. We, uh, I, I believe it is. I haven't heard from my office yet this morning on this, but uh, you know, my my district is a suburban district in Colorado, and we have received already. The hundreds of contacts uh, against SOPA um, and PIPA, uh, and actually no constituents have contacted us asking us to pass this bill. So that's that's unusual. Um, you know, typically it's more balanced. When we had health care reform, we had you know a lot of constituents even more contact us, but they were evenly split between the four and against side. We've had uh, no uh, constituents asking me to support these uh, bills. Uh, and many, many uh, constituents asking me to oppose them. They are uh, poorly construed in that not only will they not put an end uh, to piracy, uh, they, uh, the collateral damage that they cause uh, can destroy jobs, destroy innovation, uh, you know, damage the, the infrastructure of the internet itself. Um, piracy is a real problem. I tend to support uh, in fact, I'm a co-sponsor of, and I think the correct answer is more along the lines of the Open Act, which is really a follow the money approach. Um, we should have potential trade implications for countries that uh, either don't or refuse to uh, enforce copyright within their borders. But a, multi a multilateral approach is critical uh, for copyright enforcement. Um, the internet by its very nature is, is multilateral. Uh, and uh, a firewall, nation state internet uh, of any form, uh, whether for IP pretenses or for political pretenses, as China has, is uh, not uh, the best uh, route to do that. Um, this uh, SOPA also uh, leaves um, enormous, gives enormous power to our Attorney General's office uh, and the U.S. government. We've already seen other foreign governments like Russia uh, abuse uh, these types of powers. Russia, uh, of course, had a selective enforcement action against various NGOs that they were critical of under the pretense that they had pirated copies of Windows, which no doubt they did, but it turns out so did everybody else in Russia. Uh, and of course, uh, they weren't being prosecuted, so they went after 
uh, a selective group of NGOs they were critical of, and of course Microsoft did the right thing and gave a blanket license to all NGOs saying they're no longer in violation of our intellectual property. They have a blanket license so you can no longer raid them under the pretense of violating uh, intellectual property protocols. Um, so those are some of the issues as I see it. Um, I, I don't think I addressed all of the issues that you have, but I mostly wanted to see what's on your minds and what you would like to hear from the Hill. Uh, I understand you had one of my colleagues from across the aisle, Mr. Goodlock, here yesterday uh, who gave some perspective on some of these issues, uh, and I'd be happy to, uh, to uh, give the other side or fill in the blanks and whatever else I can help with. So with that, we'll open it up. There's a microphone in the middle. Hi, Congressman. This is Juliana Grunwald with National Journal. As you well know, uh, Chairman Lamar Smith yesterday said that he's going to resume his markup uh, in February on SOPA. What do you expect to happen between now and then? I mean, he's, he's uh, given in on the uh, website blocking provision. What else would you like to see happen before then? What do you expect to happen before then? Thank you. Well, we don't know what will happen before then. Uh, we have several um, uh, conflicting pieces of intelligence. The majority leader, Mr. Cantor, uh, has said that he will not bring this bill to the floor uh, until there is consensus, uh, whatever that might mean. Presumably it would mean uh, that some of the opponents today would have to be brought into the fold and changes would have to be made accordingly. Uh, but of course, uh, Mr. Cantor is not the, the chair of the committee, so something can be reported out of committee uh, and not brought to the floor as well. It's a fairly common occurrence across here. Uh, the chairman of the committee has indicated he plans to proceed with the markup, but I think we all expect an additional manager's amendment before the markup. Now, we probably will only see that about 48 hours before the markup, so we have no idea what that might entail. Uh, we had heard, in fact, many of them had claimed that they had already eliminated DNS blocking from the bill, and the previous manager's amendment did that. However, it did not. Uh, there's many other sections of the bill that I'm concerned about, the broad immunities granted in Section 105, the vast power for the Attorney General's office, and when I had the opportunity to question Attorney General Holder about this very issue, uh, he essentially admitted that they would have to use selective enforcement in enforcing that, because as we all know, there are millions or hundreds of millions of incidental copyright violations on this thing that we know as the Internet, and obviously the Attorney General's office absent, uh, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of staffing would be unable to prosecute all those, and uh, he indicated that he would have to use those powers selectively. So there's a number of issues with the bill, and I don't know which ones will be fixed, and we probably won't know until about 48 hours before that markup, and uh, we, I, I, along with others, will then hopefully work on amendments to try to address some of the remaining issues with the bill at that point. Hi, Congressman. My name is Don Blumenthal with the Public Interest Registry. And I also used to be in internet law enforcement for another uh, three-letter agency. Um, I mention that because I'm very intrigued by the Open Act, but I'm curious how well the International Trade Commission, uh, how much they're in a position to do traditional law enforcement type work. Uh, should it all be with them, or are they going to be ramped up? Uh, well, uh, you know, Law enforcement work versus, uh, you know, civil enforcement of, of, of copyright uh, and penalties for those who don't. Um, there's a law enforcement component to combating piracy, but it's not uh, the main vehicle to combat it. The main one is civil liability. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't think that the um, law enforcement approach so a strictly law enforcement approach has worked or would work, um, certainly with regards to the internet or, um, you know, a, a certainly uh, incidental uh, violations. Um, if you really want to get the attention of companies, um, civil litigation um, and civil liability uh, are the best way to do that. With regard to Open Act and, and an international approach, um, what some critics say who I think miss the point is that it would take forever, it's way too slow, you know, there's no response on a particular site or taking something down. And, and that part is, is correct. And, and, and anybody, the, the goal of an enforcement action should not be just taking down one particular site. As everybody should know, uh, the internet is much like a hydra. You can certainly take one down and two others will, will pop up. That should not be the goal of any enforcement action. That's also the problem with a law enforcement approach. It kind of goes after a particular violator. Uh, when uh, you know you take one down and, and others arise, 
Um, the correct answer is more of a systemic approach, looking at what type of sanctions would be in order for countries that uh, refuse to enforce or, or fail to enforce uh, copyright adequately within their jurisdiction, uh, where they have the ability uh, to enforce those. Um, I think we have a fine balance in the United States of America. Uh, Digital Millennial Copyrights Act, uh, I think, struck a good balance between rights holders and innovation. Uh, when there's infringing content on a website, uh, notice is sent. There's an opportunity for a counter notice. There's an opportunity to remedy that. The whole site isn't taken down. The infringing content is taken down. Uh, it works relatively well. Uh, an internationalized uh, Digital Millennial Copyrights Act uh, with, again, a civil um, uh, liability uh, side, I think, would be a, a more effective way to go after internet piracy than certainly strictly a law enforcement approach, uh, as well as a uh, SOPA approach, uh, which is kind of blocking entire entities or websites uh, who seem to be thought of as pirates. There <coughs> are so many provisions in SOPA that I think are counterproductive. One of them that we didn't get to this amendment, and if it's still in there, I'll still be offering it, but it might be something they remove, I don't know, has this concept of labeling uh, individuals as notorious uh, infringers and sort of somehow blacklisting them from the internet itself um, or doing everything under their power to do that. And, and uh, what, what, again, this is something that fails to kind of understand the culture or sociological significance of the internet. I can guarantee you if there's, you know, somebody sitting in, you know, Vladivostok toiling in obscurity and, and, and pirating money and, uh, you know, making it illegal living at that now, if the United States names him a notorious character, he will receive, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of support and love letters from across the internet, only helping his bid to uh, engage in piracy. Um, just as we saw with, of course, uh, WikiLeaks, the bane of the U.S. government and so many others, and we have seen uh, much grassroots money flow to that in large part because of its notoriety. So the last thing we want to do is create notoriety uh, among uh, pirates uh, because uh, it only aids and abets their uh, ability to, to take intellectual property. Another question, Congressman? Uh, thanks, Congressman. Wendy Seltzer with uh, Yale Law School Information Society Project. I've, I've really appreciated uh, your advocacy for balance here. Uh, and you, of course, know that there are hundreds of people and thousands of websites blacking out today. Um, do you have suggestions on what we can do going forward between now and the markups on these bills to uh, help your colleagues understand the, uh, the range of opposition to, to these bills? I, I think that again, and, and I've, I've looked at it, I went on this morning, many of these sites are directing people to call their members. I fully expect that mem every member of Congress will receive many calls on this. That's good because it gets this issue on their radar, hey, this is a controversial bill. Most members of Congress will then um, avoid trying to take positions on something that has this level of controversy. So they'll kind of leave it out there hoping that it doesn't, they don't have to take a position, that's, <laughs> that it doesn't come before them. Obviously judiciary, uh, it'll be a little bit uh, quicker. I think the key thing will be is we'll need to react to how these bills change. Uh, we don't know what uh, in the House the chairman uh, has in store uh, for the markup. We don't know how he'll be modifying the bill. We don't know in the Senate uh, how the bill uh, will be brought to the floor or if the, what the manager's amendment will contain. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, but the public interest needs to be ongoing. It can't just be a flash uh, uh, in, in the night. Um, and I think it, it's, it's etched itself in the minds of so many uh, people who enjoy the Internet and users who use the Internet, obviously the technological companies as well, uh, helping to facilitate their communications with members of Congress, um, that hopefully that's the case. Uh, I think there's a cover article in the New York Times today, in fact, and kind of they said this is kind of the first example of the internet, you know, waking up politically, and it really is. There's, um, I've never seen this level of interest in a public policy issue uh, from uh, users of the internet across the country and across the world. I um, did a uh, Ask Me Anything on Reddit the other day, and there's a lot of frustration from residents of other countries saying, what can I do to, you know, lobby? I, and I, I had to respond, no, there's really nothing you can do to lobby a congressperson. What you can do is try to ensure that your own politicians are better educated on this issue, that you educate your members of parliament, whether you're in Holland or uh, whether you're in Australia. Uh, and I think if there had been more education of our members of Congress before this point, we wouldn't be at this point either. So uh, it's come to this point. Uh, I think members of Congress are aware that this is a controversial issue. Uh, and uh, generally, members of Congress want to avoid controversial issues. Congressman, do you have time for another couple questions? Sure. Uh, hi, Congressman. Larry Downs. Uh, thank you, by the way, again, for your continued uh, leadership on, on SOPA. 
I'm just sort of curious if you have um, a more proactive agenda that you'd like to see Congress pursue maybe after the election. Uh, are there things that you think the government could do effectively to help the internet economy, whether it's in basic research, whether it's in infrastructure, uh, FCC reform, uh, education? Are there sort of, you know, have you got pet projects you think that would be very helpful that you would like to see move forward? Sure. I mean, one that, again, I, I, I might devote some time to just to kind of scope out the intellectual framework, but I don't expect to move legislatively anytime soon, is one I referred to earlier, which is fixing our patent system, sort of coming up with a patent system for uh, the digital and biological era in the 21st century. Um, some thought needs to be done on that. I'm happy to start uh, that process more uh, imminently. A couple of things that you've mentioned. Um, I happen to be, I'm a supporter of uh, net neutrality. I think that's consistent with a free and open internet, just as uh, stopping bills like SOPA is. Uh, and uh, I will continue to support that. I think uh, the, the rulemaking process um, at the FCC has you know, come to a reasonable balance on that issue as well. Uh, and this is a uh, potential problem that needs to be monitored. And if, in fact, uh, there are privately firewalled internets, um, that can be just as problematic as government firewalled internets. Um, this has not been any large problem to date. But uh, if we see uh, the direction uh, moving towards uh, tiered pricing and selective uh, access to the end user, um, that's something that I would want to be wary of as well. Um, the internet taxation issue obviously needs some more discussion as well. I, I'm generally opposed to kind of precipitous efforts to jump towards uh, taxing transactions. But yes, there's a real issue there. And again, one solution would be states can simply move away from sales tax as a source of revenue. It seems to me that's the easiest one. But if they insist on using it, uh, we have to figure out exactly how that looks in an economy where uh, it's, it's a, a smaller world. Congressman Steve DelBianco with NetChoice. And uh, picking up on your tax point, um, as we move from more, from, from uh, buying goods, tangible goods, to more services, the sourcing question you brought up is going to become paramount. Because if I'm buying a digital service, a download of something I would have ordinarily purchased, it's going to pass through servers in multiple states. And they all claim a piece of the pie, right, for sourcing the transaction. So it's not so much who pays the tax, but who, who gets the revenue. So you talked about income and property taxes, a potential issue. What uh, w would the uh, opponents of that idea suggest that those were more regressive or maybe more, or would you suggest that they're less regressive than a sales tax? I, I think a sales tax is one of the most regressive, regressive forms of tax that we have. Um, and I mean, you know, you look at uh, something like, uh, you could take an example on, you know, the Warren Buffett level, you know, even, even, even my level, there, there's no, there's no way to, we, the, 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 your consumer, uh, your, your consumption of sales taxable goods is in no way commensurate with your income. Uh, you know, I mean, Warren Buffett may very well buy three or four times or even ten times as much uh, taxable goods as, as you or I, uh, but uh, that is completely not commensurate with his income. So the fact that he only pays 17 percent income tax is actually far more progressive than the uh, well under 1% uh, he would pay in sales tax, whereas somebody who's earning thirty dollars or $40,000 a year uh, will pay uh, very close to 5 or 6% of their income in sales tax. Most of their purchases uh, will be items that are um, for the sales tax. For those reasons, uh, those are among the reasons I'm not a fan of sales tax in general. Um, I don't believe overall we have a, a very progressive taxation system. Yes, we have a, a marginal rate. Uh, that is higher for people who earn more money, but sales tax is so regressive that it roughly evens out. And I've seen studies to that effect. Uh, we might have a very slightly progressive system. We might have a slightly regressive system, particularly on the very high end. Um, but uh, sales tax is not only a very complicated way to figure out who gets what in an era where, as you said, something might touch servers in a number of states. Uh, but I don't think it's a, a particularly good way uh, for the economy to grow either to effectively penalize consumption uh, and, 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 and put the burden of taxation on people who have to spend much of their income simply to get by. Well, Congressman, um, thank you for your time today. Um, I want to thank, wish you luck with um, the SOFA debates going forward and everything else you're going to be doing in the Judiciary Committee. And congratulations relatedly on the four-month-old. I, I have no idea. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.